Good morning. Trust you can hear me. Well, it's been a little while. I started the series on the Lord's Prayer. Um, it's been a few months back. I don't know how many will remember uh, what we covered there. But anyway, um, what we did cover was, you know, the disciples asked Jesus how they should pray. So he started off with, you know, we know where God is. Our Father, which art in heaven. And not only is he in heaven, but that's... You know, we can depend on that for sure. Um, and also, he said that he is our father. And a father not to just one race, but to all races, to all nations, kindred and such. We're thankful for the Godhead, for God, and Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. Um, I will have to make a little disclaimer here. What I'm presenting to you, um, I did not write. I found this in one of our elders' magazines and thought it was uh, very good, so I wanted to present it to you. So um, these actually came from uh, William uh, Barclay, uh, the, the Gospel of Matthew, and, um, oh, that's part of the presentation here. Uh, actually, the gentleman who wrote this, his name is Rex Edwards. He's a former vice president of the religious studies at Griggs University. So I'll have that covered. So let's uh, bow our heads and we'll start our uh, service today. Gracious Heavenly Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We are so thankful for all the many blessings that you have given to us. We're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples many, many, many years ago and that it is still pertinent to this day. So as I present this to our folks here, I pray that our hearts will be open to understand the meaning of the Lord's Prayer. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. The mood of the Lord's Prayer is set with the first two words in Matthew 6, 9. The first word fractures the hermit's life. Oh, I think I already read that, didn't I? I think that was part of last week, sorry. Oh, that was to remind me of what, what, what I had covered. Okay, let's get started here. The Lord's Prayer. Petition 1. Hallowed be thy name. In the introduction to the Lord's Prayer, God is in heaven, all-powerful, all-knowing, surveying his creation from a lofty height. Our thoughts must rise to him. And so we now pray that his very name and thus his sacred person be hallowed by all men. Two questions emerge from this plea. What does hallowed mean? And what significance is attached to quote unquote name in the Hebrew culture. The word translated hollowed is part of the Greek uh, verb, and I'm not even gonna try to pronounce this. <laughs> the verb is connected with the objective hagios and means to treat a person or a thing as hagios. This objective has two meanings. The basic meaning is ho uh, holy, but more importantly, it means different or separate. In other words, if a thing is hagios, it is different from other things, and a person who is hagios is separate from other people, which certainly describes God. He is different from us. So a temple is hagios because it is different from other buildings. A priest is hagios because he is separate from other men. So what does this petition mean? Let God's name be treated differently from all other names. Let God's name be given a position which is absolutely unique. Amen. The significance of the name in the Hebrew culture is in the traditional cultures, a name simply, simply means the name by which a person is called, such as George or John or Mary. By contrast, in Hebrew, the name means the nature, the character, and the personality of the person. This becomes clear when we see how the psalmist used name. For instance, in Psalms 20, verse 7 says, Some boast of, a, of chariots and some horses, but we boast of the name of the Lord our God. 
This means while some put their trust in human and material aids and defenses, the psalmist will remember the nature and character of God. He will remember what God is like, and that memory will give him confidence. Now, if we put the biblical meaning of hollowed to regard as different, together with the Hebrew usage of the name, nature, character, personality, then when we pray, hallowed be thy name, it means, enable us to give you the unique place which your nature and character deserve and demand. In other words, this first petition in the Lord's Prayer demands that we give God the reverence he is due. William Barclay describes that, that in all true reverence, there are four essentials. Number one, reverence implies a brief belief, excuse me, that God exists. The Bible makes no attempt to prove the existence of God. It is the self-evident truth. To a Bible writer, any attempt to prove the existence of God would be superfluous, simply because they experience God every moment of their lives. Those who seek for proof that God exists might reflect in the words of Kant, who said, the moral law within us and the starry world above us drive us to God. Number two. Reverence requires a knowledge of God. The God we know has three great qualities, holiness, justice, and love. We must reverence God not only because he exists, but because he is the God we know him to be. May this idea of God be treasure on which our hearts rest and hold separate from all contamination, of our own thoughts from God. Reverence, no, number three, reverence involves a constant awareness of God. The reverence God means to live in a God-filled world, to live a life in which we never forget God, such, as awareness is, such an awareness is not confined to church or so-called holy places. It is rather an awareness that invades all aspects of our lives. This awareness is not spasmodic, acute at certain times and places, or totally absent at others. It is like an omnipresent consciousness of his abiding presence. Number four, reverence is obedience and submission to God. Similarly, reverence is knowledge plus submission. Martin Luther asked, how is God's name hallowed among us? And his answer is, when both our life and doctrine are truly Christian. That is to say, when our intellectual convictions and our practical actions are in full submission to the will of God. May our obedience and submission be guarded as the holy and reverend name of the Lord. The Lord's Prayer and the Decalogue. One question remains, is there a relationship, relationship between the first petition of the Lord's Prayer and the third commandment of the Decalogue? To answer that question, we must ask, what did it mean to biblical writer to desecrate the name of God? How did we conceive that it could be defiled, dishonored, or treated as though it were not sacred? No doubt very often in Jewish history it was thought that the name of God was desecrated if some ritual taboo is disobeyed. If a prescribed sacrifice was not offered or if a corpse was touched, but the prophets taught in many a stinging phrase that it was possible to be richly, ritually correct and at the same time ethically wrong, and then this way the name of God was desecrated. The third commandment originally had little, if anything, to do with the use of what we call bad language. To take the name of the Lord thy God in vain was to fail in the ethical duty of keeping a vow or fulfilling an obligation solemnly made to one's neighbor. If, conversely, such an obligation was kept, 
then the name of God was hallowed. The name of God is desecrated when the poor are crushed, when a widow is denied her rights, when unused scales are, unjust scales are used in commerce, when sexually immorality takes place. As in Amos 2, verse 7, and it reads, A man and his father go into the same maiden, so that my holy name is profane. But when the name of God is hallowed, all facets of everyday life and ethics are affected. William Neal comments, To take God's name in vain is to refuse, refuse to take seriously the claim of God to command our obedience in social, political, and economic affairs, as well as in our private lives. We can now translate this petition into everyday lives. You have some great tasks to do, some great decision to make. You begin it with prayer, hallowed be thy name. You complete it with the Gloria, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. That task, that decision will not be far from the will and the purpose of God. You have some small tasks to do with hand or brain, a letter to write, a visit to pay, a chore to labor at. You begin with, hallowed be thy name, you end with Gloria. It will become an act of worship. P.T. Pelgrave got near to the mark in his hymn, O thou not made thy with hands, where in life's common ways, we cheerful, with cheerful feet we go, where in his steps we tread. Who trod the way of woe, where he is in the heart, city of God thou art. Yes, there the name of God is hallowed. Petition 2, Thy Kingdom Come. John the Baptist was surrounded by excited crowds when he shouted in the desert, the kingdom of heaven is near. The sense of anticipation grew when a little later, Jesus echoed John's words as he began his ministry in Galilee. The time has come, he exclaimed, the kingdom of God has come near. And that's found in Mark 1 verse 15. God's wisdom was central to Jesus' mission and message. When he taught his disciples how to pray, he told them to ask God, may your kingdom come. When he sent his disciples out on their first preaching expedi uh, expeditions, it was the kingdom of God that was to be at the heart of the good news they were told to spread. That's in Matthew 7, uh, 10, verse 7, excuse me. Jesus used the phrase often and described the preaching of the kingdom as an obligation laid upon him. But while there are more than 100 references to it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it occurs only rarely in the New Testament outside the Gospels, and the Old Testament does not mention it at all. It was a special to Jesus. When the Baptist hearers were told the kingdom is coming, what would they have expected? They imagine the image of a king would have had their three major features, a person of power, status, and a person who would be a national figurehead. The great movement of God's royal intervention and subsequent defeat of Israel's enemies, forecast so urgently by the Old Testament prophets, was about to arrive. In fact, with Jesus' arrival on the world scene, it had already come. In Jesus, the kingdom of God had become a reality. Nevertheless, Jesus' expectant audiences was in for a shock. He certainly was the promised king, but he turned their ideas about God's rule upside down. They were expecting a display of power, but Jesus taught them that the focal point of God's kingdom was the gentle, merciful empowerment of the weak and disabled members of the society. He crushed the powers of evil in a stunning series of miracles and taught that his kingdom was for the suffering, not for the rich and the powerful. Yes, amen. 
They were expecting a parade of status, but God's king was not born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He began his human life in the squalor of a stable. He turned his back on conventional royal respectability by spending time with those whom the rest of society regarded as inferior, as in lepers, foreigners, women, and he left life carrying a cross, not waving a royal banner. They were expecting a national figurehead to rid their land of Roman occu occupation and establish Jewish supremacy. Jesus refused to fill that political role. There was to be no passport control that favored Jews at the entry point to God's kingdom. And you find that in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. The nature of the kingdom. In Jesus' hands, the kingdom of God became a dynamic idea, rule rather than realm. In the New Testament, the kingdom of God is not the territory which God reigns as an earthly king reigns. It is the sovereignty of God, a state, a condition of things in which God rules and reigns supreme. To be a citizen of the kingdom of God is to accept and obey his law, as would be required for citizenship in any earthly kingdom. If the kingdom of God means the sovereignty of God, then no man can be within that kingdom unless he submits himself to the lordship of God in perfect obedience to his requirements. But the qualification for entering it is not the right kind of birth certificate, birth certificate, but rather a radically changed lifestyle characterized by repentance and faith. There are patterns of behavior totally incompatible with a genuine submission to God's rule. For example, no man can enter without a forgiving spirit, as in Matthew 18, 3, or without a certain attitude towards his fellow man, found in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. While there are certain conditions of entry to the kingdom, there are things that life can conspire to keep a man out of the kingdom. For instance, riches, or the inability to make clear-cut decision. Further, the invitation to enter the kingdom can, re be, can be refused. The opportunity to enter the kingdom can be lost, and the privilege of entering the kingdom can be taken away. Conversely, all who submit to the sovereignty and place themselves under his dominion find that his royal power is immediately available to cancel the power of their past sin, and by his spirit and his presence are enabled to overcome their present sin. Amen. It should be noted that nowhere in the teaching of Jesus is the kingdom defined, yet it is illustrated by parable, and his invitations and demands are cons uh, consistently stressed. The kingdom is indeed present reality. The kingdom is preached. The kingdom is proclaimed. The good news of the kingdom is announced. The kingdom may be received. The kingdom may be entered. The kingdom is within you or within, uh, within you or among you. Only a reality which is already given and already present can be spoken of in such terms. There is also a now but not yet dimension to Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of God. Although God's rule is powerfully present in his own words and actions, his stories with the purpose, the parables, paint word pictures of slow growth as the kingdom, now his church, is gradually established, like yeast in dough or a small seed slow transformation in an impressive tree. The final outcome, however, is inevitable. When Jesus comes again to wind up the history of the world as we know it, the kingdom of God will be displayed in total triumph. This, then, is an eschatological prayer. We look up and forward, up to God who reigns, 
and forward to the day of victory when the enemy's death sentence is pronounced. Like it or not, all creation will submit to his power. His royal status will be blazoned from one end of the universe to the other. And he will emerge as the church's great figurehead as it demonstrates the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Finally, the kingdom of God begins within, but it is to make itself manifest without. It is to penetrate the feelings, habits, thoughts, words, and acts of him who is the subject of it. For this we pray when we say, Thy kingdom come, we desire that the King of kings and Lord of lords will reign over our lives, which are his and which he has redeemed. The next section of the Lord's Prayer, which he calls Petition 3, Thy will be done as it is in heaven. In the second of the petition of the Lord's Prayer, we prayed for God's kingdom, that it may be set up and established in our hearts. For his visible kingdom, the church, that it may increase. And for his heavenly kingdom, that it may soon drive away and put an end to every kind of sin and sorrow. But we cannot desire that he be king over the earth without desiring that his will be done on earth. We do not sincerely own, sincerely, sincerely own him as king unless we set his will above our own and every other. A king whose will is not done is a dethron dethroned king. This brings us to the third petition. Thy will be done is the foundation of all prayer. What is a prayer? It is not the mere means of trying to extort something from God, nor an attempt to change the will of God regarding us, as if, by our continual asking, we might obtain certain things God had hitherto denied us. It is, first of all, an acknowledgement on our part that God knows what is best for us. We cannot rightly ask for anything unless we ask for it humbly, um, humble dependence upon the will of God, unless in asking we are conscious that we do not desire it unless God desires it for us. Thy will be done is to be the spirit of every true life. We learn that we do not stand alone. We gradually there is born in us the triumphant consciousness of a life lived not according to any self-willed object or desire, but unfolding itself step by step, according to the complete and perfect plan cherished for it in the heart of God. With the psalmist, we can, um, can exclaim, O Lord, our, my God, in thee do I put my trust. My times are in thy hands. This mature state uh, toward which uh, should strive is the following. If we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that we, obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Thy will be done is to be done here on earth and now. We are told that the angels of God do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. And then they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. And the ministry of the angels is, as this petition teaches us, to the, be the model of our ministry. Thy will be done demands assent. Is it possible that Mary herself had a special share in teaching her son how to pray it? For she herself had prayed, prayed it, not so may, many words, but at least in essence, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. That's found in Luke 1, verse 38. 
Jesus learned the lesson in part from her when his great moment of crisis came. He knew how to pray in agony in the garden. Thy will be done. His was the great ascent, the great yes to the will of God had hers had been. Thy will be done requires servanthood. Mary had interpreted her ascent in terms of servanthood. Behold the handmaiden, the servant, and the slave of the Lord, she said. There is nothing more abject or lower than a slave. It requires absolute subordination and obedience to a master. As it had been with Mary, so it was with her son. What Jesus learned at his mother's feet, knee about the meaning of being a servant of the Lord, he found elaborated in Isaiah's pictures of the suffering servant. It, may, it seems that Jesus interpreted his mission as Messiah in their light when the great temptation came to him in the wilderness. It came in the form of a temptation to interpret, inter, in, excuse me, interpret his mission in terms of power and popularity. Three times he was tempted. Three times he refused the temptation. He was to be the servant of the Lord and the servant of, the, of his people. Only so could he redeem, restore, and rescue. Messiahship was to be accomplished by love and service and sacrifice. Behold the servant of the Lord. Here I am, I have come to do your will, as recorded in Hebrews 10, verse 9. His will and the Father's were one. Thy will be done is without any reservations. The prayer of consent, the prayer of assent, my yes to the divine will. What does it mean? In what spirit does such surrender manifest? It could be in the spirit of a broken, abject surrender, as by one who is beaten to his knees by a superior, an electable force. It could be in the spirit of weary resignation, as by one who has come to see and admit that further resistance is useless. It could be in the spirit of bitter resentment, as by one who has ceased to struggle and who has accepted the inevitable but who still shakes his fist in the face of fate. It may be in a spirit of utter love and trust, as by one who does not need to understand in order to submit. He knows that a father's hand will never cause harm, and who realizes that he is not a plaything of circumstances, or the sport of a capricious God. He is certain that he can take his life and leave it in God's hand and be content. Jesus in Gethsemane is the most notable example of this dimension of surrender. Even in the face of a mystery, even when the heart cries out for some evidence, some token, however small, of the nearness of God, of the presence of Christ, if only we say, for one moment he could rend the veil and for one moment the walk of faith might be turned to the wonder of sight but no, it does not happen. It is then that God looks to us for our assent. Lord, if that is thy way for me, behold the servant, the handmaid of the Lord, but do it according to thy will. That will work out in steady continuance, in prayer, Bible study, and in service. In that way, there will be no embitterment but a deepening of the spiritual life. That way, God will fashion the servant, a handmaid, or more after his own pattern, and until the day dawns when faith comes way, gives way to sight, and his servants shall worship him, they shall see him face to face. God will give the grace of steady continuance the grace, if not, to mount up of wings of eagles, or even to run and not be weary, then at least to walk and not faint. And perhaps that is the greatest grace of all. Amen.
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you with honor and glory. We're thankful for Jesus. We thank you for the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples. We have gone through part of it, and next time we're here, we will finish that. But we certainly appreciate the prayer and the deep meaning that is in that prayer. And my prayer is that as we go forth today, that you will bless us all and give us a safe journey home and bring us back again to your presence. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.